everybody, and welcome to a special edition of the podcast here. Uh, if you are a regular listener, you probably have heard us talk a little bit about sports analytics. We're all sports fans here, and I find a lot of the sports. things in sports analytics cross-apply a bit to board game thought and how we approach strategy and tactics and all that. So, along that route, we have a very special guest here today. Uh, someone I knew of, at least in high school, we were in the same high school debate league, named Sam Wolkenhauer. Say hello. Howdy. And Sam, you work for what, the state of Washington? I work for the state of Idaho as a statistician, so spreadsheet jockey. Nice, nice. And in your spare time, you do football analytics, among other sports, but mainly football, with a system you've developed called PEAT Ratings, which... I have thoroughly enjoyed over the last couple of years because it seems to me that you have, you know, not alone, but you have tried to bring some clear rationality to analyzing sports where the analysis we often see on television is sorely lacking. Um, so uh, I brought Sam here today to talk about sports analytics and maybe we can get into a little bit of crossover of how uh, the way people think about sports often airs in the same way that we approach strategy in board gaming. Of course, I have my regular two compatriots with me as well, Matt. Hello. And Orion. Hey, how's it going? So, Sam, what got you first interested in analytics? I don't actually know if you've written or talked about this before. Was it just you enjoy football and you enjoy stats and you decided to merge them one day? That's pretty much the story. So I, I studied math and economics in college. And basically, I had sort of a, a, an assignment for a, a statistics course I was doing where, you know, you can choose any topic you want. And so naturally, I chose football statistics. And I, I started modeling a really simple aspect of football. What I was trying to model was, do teams win because they are running the ball? Or are they running the ball because they're already winning the game? And so I started modeling that issue for this assignment in school. And it got me thinking about all the inefficiencies that exist in how football is coached and how it's thought about among fans. And it just kind of snowballed from there into this bigger set of algorithms and models that I've been developing over the years. Yeah, and... From what I understand, your model is really trying to pinpoint the data sets that actually have predictive value. Is that correct? That, that's exactly correct. What I'm trying to do is filter out aspects of the football game that are explanatory, meaning they may go a long way to explaining to us why one of the teams won the game. But they don't do very well predicting whether or not that team will win future games. So mm -hmm. basically what I try to do is just filter out all the things that are explanatory from the things that actually will predict future games. And then I isolate those issues and, and uh, formulate them into a system that lets us predict future games. Yeah, and I imagine that's... That's tough to do in a lot of areas. Like I, I pay attention a bit more to baseball analytics just because I like baseball a little bit more and that in there it seems to be a bit more cut and dry in what you can actually statistically outline and say okay obviously if this guy has a larger slugging percentage he's going to be more offensively productive on net uh generally than someone who has a lesser slugging percentage but in football it seems a lot more difficult i know something like turnovers i believe you've argued is is more or less random in in terms of its predictive value and, and that's something that is, is that accurate? I, I'm trying to remember things you've written oh, yeah. before. Oh, yeah. Yeah, turnovers Turnovers are a great example, and especially fumble recoveries. Oh, and Because yeah. when you think about it, a fumble recovery is, is random. Uh, you don't even really have to do any statistical test to see that. You just have to go outside and, like, throw a football on the ground. So it's not actually a it's ball. It's chaos. not a sphere. It's watch. Yeah, it, it bounces randomly. And recovering fumbles is really important if you want to win a game. But just because a team recovers all of its fumbles in one week has no prediction value in terms of are they going to recover their fumbles next week. So that's like when you hear people say, oh, well, they, you know, they recovered five fumbles and that's why they won the game or whatnot. 
well, that's not a skill. That's like saying someone's you know good at flipping a coin. So we want to remove those things from the equation and focus on the things that are actually indicative of some sort of underlying skill or efficiency that the team has. And that's, I think, you know, we're, like I said, we're going to try to talk about some cognitive errors that people make when analyzing things like sports. And I think that kind of hits on something that I've identified both in sports and in board gaming where people criticize decisions or they criticize or they or they pinpoint key moments that in hindsight yes were key but weren't predictive or weren't you know weren't necessarily the optimal play at the time so like fumbles i guess is kind of a, a half uh, or a roundabout way of getting there but things like you know if someone going forward on fourth down is the correct or incorrect move based on the information at the time of the decision it's not necessarily uh, correct or incorrect because of the result of the play because you, you you don't have that information at the at the decision time and oftentimes I hear especially in football where they'll say you know the announcers will even say something like well whether or not this is a good call is dependent on whether or not it succeeds which is nonsense no oh, absolutely and part of the reason for that is that NFL head coaches especially, you know, new, relatively newly minted head coaches, they're on such a short leash that they really can't think about things like sample size. Yeah. So on fourth down, you know, it's been pretty well documented, not not just by me, but by pretty much anybody who has actually looked at, at the expected values that football coaches are really irrational on fourth down, that they tend to punt and kick field goals when they really should be going for it. And, you know, mathematically we can show, well, in this, you know, in these situations, going for it is is going to yield this many excess points over 100 tries. But so often the way the game is scrutinized, these coaches aren't thinking about, okay, how many times am I going to break even on 100 tries? They're thinking about taking a risk on one play and falling short and that becoming a, a sort of defining moment that, you know, it leads to them being fired after one season as head coach. And so I think that coaches are on such a short leash that they really aren't free to engage in, well, let's just call it what it is, in, in rational decision making because they're so scared of being caught out making the aggressive choice. Football is so, um, I'm not sure I have the, have the language for this, but it's, it's not so much a fluid sport. So there are kind of defining moments when you look back at a game and they could be yes. very random. Yes, that's, very random. that's true. And, it's and it's so, not like baseball where you have, you know, you have well over like 150 games in a season and you have all these, you know, thousands of at-bats. It's right. a much smaller sample size. And so one play can really swing the outcome of a game in a way that you don't necessarily see in, in a sport like baseball. I think that's partially why baseball may have become more open to analytics. Right, yeah. Um, so that, this is the, the kind of situation that I think translates directly to board games, just to comment on that now, where the, the possibility that a decision goes wrong and then becomes a defining moment, we, we, we weigh those defining moments that could go wrong so much more heavily in our mind. We don't want to take the risk that just like knocks us out of contention at a board game, even if on average it's the best play. And and, and, that, and that's something that is true in, and probably in life in general. But uh, Yeah, well, I mean, it comes back in board games kind of to what we were talking about, was it last week or the week before, with randomness and about in a game, the the feeling of randomness can, can change so dramatically based on kind of high leverage situations like well i'm thinking of like the game of root we played the other day where you ryan you had a 15 out of 16 chance of winning the game with the play you took at the end and you rolled that one in 16 chance regardless of that outcome you still made the correct move in that i disagree situation. i am highly skilled at root guys <laughs> Uh, but I was talking about this earlier on Twitter with with a, a fairly prominent game designer who was saying that, you know, the risk mitigation is he had kind of the same disagreement we had about not really disagreement, but misunderstanding about risk mitigation as a skill. But my point is that in a game, 
anytime you have elements of chance or elements of randomness, obviously you want to mitigate that risk as best and as rationally as possible, but it still results in skill being less influential on net over the over the outcome, right? And that but that's a trade-off that we fully accept in a game. You know, football is exciting because it has those moments. Th- those moments of randomness and uncertainty and, you know, the bounce of a ball determining the outcome. And that's exciting to view. And the key to the game is being able to look through all that kind of random noise and pull out the the kind of rational decision making that you need to try to mitigate the risks as much as possible. Yeah, that's that's exactly true. And in football, the way I characterize this is that coaches prefer what I call the slow death. Which yeah. is, you prefer to make these overly conservative choices that slowly whittle you away, and you lose the game in the end, but it feels like they, they feel like they lost it the correct way. And so it doesn't bother them as badly as if they had taken an aggressive choice and lost early, even though that gave them a better chance to win in the end. I'm thinking of this the game that was played just tonight, um between the Lions and the Jets, and the Jets were really starting to pull away, and the Lions came out really conservatively, and they had a fourth down and two near midfield, and analytics tells us that you should go for it there, uh, especially when you're down. You need points because you're chasing, and they punted it, and the announcers said, well, that's really smart, you know, because it's probably tempting to go for it, but, you know, you got to just go out there and and play the game plan and do the smart thing. Well, the Jets returned the punt for a touchdown. And somehow that seems better because you can just throw your hands up and go, oh, you know, they returned the punt. And that, and then that saves you because it's like, well, we were just unlucky there. It was like you were unlucky, but you also made a dumb choice, right? Yeah, yeah. The randomness of the punt return doesn't mitigate the initial decision. Exactly. To do the sub exactly. play. Yeah. Well, which which goes into another interesting thing about the game of football is that you have, again, these, these different games going on with different incentives. Now, ostensibly, you would think that in any sport, all the incentives for everyone in an organization would align, and that alignment would be we want to win as many games as possible. You know, you can think short term or long term, but overall, that's kind of where you'd think it would go. But that's not necessarily the case because it seems there is this tradition and rhetoric rhetoric around football of playing kind of the correct way or making these suboptimal moves that's, or, or, or decisions that have been proven to be suboptimal that coaches who want to maintain a job and have a salary are going to air in making more conservative plays and then maybe owners err on risking it all for a big name quarterback in the draft when the best decision would be to like improve their offensive line because yes they want to win games but more importantly they want to put people in the seats and that creates a whole bunch of other maybe counter win incentives uh, which i find super interesting I mean, thinking again, applying this to board to board games in Netrunner, uh, where you have you know or any kind of collectible competitive card game, you have a little bit of that kind of multi layer decision making. Where yes, you want to win, but you also have pressures to kind of go with the community consensus on what strategies or deck constructions or plans seem to be good except in rare cases with those people who really want to go against the norm i'm thinking of like cambridge pe ryan you know that took longer than it needed to to come out as a good deck because it was seen because just the thousand cut strategy was seen as not very good until someone showed otherwise right well in board gamings there in board gaming there's kind of two incentives one is to win and the other is to have fun and kind of as a a, a subtext a of that dynamic. is to make sure everyone is having fun, and that's less so in a tournament, but that I think that can still bleed over so that certain so-called degenerate strategies that you know are anti called anti fun or things that lock the game or uh, non interactive non interactive or yeah. strategies that tend to take really long and go to time or things like that are kind of looked down upon as uh, 
lesser strategies, even if their win percentage is higher. Yeah, which Things is an like, interesting uh, dynamic. I don't think people think about, right? That yeah. there are multiple games being played. Pulling it back back to football, Sam, where do you see kind of the biggest deviations on those where where incentives for various players do not align with winning football games? Well, the main problem comes with coaching. Uh, and you see this especially with how coaches relate to the quarterback position. Uh, but but basically, you end up with a situation, and, and generally this is going to be ownership's problem because they put a short time constraint on the coach. You know, you only have like two or three seasons to turn the team around maximum. And sometimes that's just not feasible. So they create a situation where the coach has a different timeline than the one that is actually best for the team's long-term success. And great examples of this are when teams end up with a young quarterback, what these quarterbacks need most of the time is to play. And even though they're going to go out there and play and they're going to suck because, you know, the pace of the game is overwhelming for them and there's all this information and they have to refine their mechanics. And so these quarterbacks are going to be bad. But they need to play because that's how they get better. And coaches that are under you know, time pressure, like you need to win now and you need to win in the next two seasons or I'm going to fire you, well, they're afraid to play these young quarterbacks, to actually give them you know, the, the, the repetitions and let them have the in-game experience. So they turn to these really mediocre veterans who will go out and maybe we can win six out of 16 games with this veteran, maybe even seven. And that's definitely more games than we would have won with the rookie. But, yeah, so in, in but the what short, does it gain us long term, right? Yeah, the short term gain is that your franchise doesn't feel as embarrassed that you won 50% or slightly below. But right, does that right. get you a championship in the next three years? Yeah, it's like we went out and we had a respectable record with this 36-year-old quarterback who's, you know, he's mildly competent, but letting him play isn't going to win us a Super Bowl. We might win a Super Bowl four or five, six years down the road if we actually put our rookie out and let him develop and let him have the play, the playing time, and and see what these defenses are like. But the coaches are scared to do that because they are operating on a different timeline than the timeline that is most, you know, most in the team's long-run interest. And that's how you end up with these teams that are just kind of stuck you know, we say stuck at 500, you know, they win seven or eight games year in and year out and they just, they can't get anywhere. And it's because the coach is forever trying not to get fired. He's not trying to win a Super Bowl someday. And I think the other part of the developmental side is that when that coach, maybe they do play the rookie more than, I don't know, enough that they lost, you know, that they went three and 13 or something and then they get fired, and then the quarterback is stuck in a new offensive scheme with a new coordinator, a new coaching staff, and a lot of their development process or progress is set back, and they have to learn, you know, starting over again, and that undermines the whole the whole point. Right. I think of this, a great example was the Dolphins last year. So Ryan Tannehill is, is their, their quarterback for the future, but he was hurt. And so they had some young quarterbacks on the roster, and everyone knew the Dolphins weren't going to make the playoffs. It was essentially a lost season, but the coach, they paid $10 million to bring in this old kind of over-the-hill veteran, um, Jay Cutler, and they paid him $10 million, and they won. I think they won six games, which is better than they would have done without him, but for why are you paying $10 million just so some of your other young quarterbacks can not get game experience? And so it was wasted money and it was a wasted season as far as that offense went i'm curious sam do you have a feeling for how many games a coaching a a coaching staff is worth in the nfl for comparison in 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 the nhl coaching is generally not considered very important by the analytics community i think i've heard like it's a five game swing of like the best coaches to the to the worst over coach. the eighty game season over an eighty two game season yeah do you have a sense for what coaching is worth well we it's it's difficult to say mainly because the sample sizes are smaller but to me coaching coaching can easily be worth six or seven games in the NFL which is really substantial I mean probably the best example is to look at the Rams. 
the the Rams went from being like a a seven or six win team to being one of the best teams in the NFL just because they hired well he's actually the youngest coach in in the NFL he's only 31 years old but he's really creative and really dynamic and because he's young I think he's not constrained by sort of the established wisdom and he remade that team into into a, a, an 11 win team so so he added I think five wins which is a lot in a 16 win season you know he added five wins and that roster really didn't change a whole lot year to year yeah that's that's crazy on the other side I think I saw maybe Mike Clay or someone someone on Twitter was saying that Hugh Jackson like actively lost the Browns three additional games and they should have won based on I forget if it was their like Pythagorean scoring or their yards per play or some stat like that that he like actively removed three wins from their season. Uh, I I believe that I don't I don't think Hugh Jackson is is a good head coach by any stretch. They have only won one out of thirty one games, and everyone knew their roster wasn't good. But I think it's pretty clear if you looked at their roster. They were not nearly that bad. They should have been winning at least three or four games those those seasons. And yeah. Hugh, Hugh Jackson is one of those coaches who is actually a really good offensive coordinator, but there's he just doesn't have the the game management and the organizational skills to be a head coach, which does happen sometimes even with people who have a good brain for the actual scheme on the field. Beyond his ability. Well, at least mm-hmm. they've upgraded to ties now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm almost okay with the Steelers tying them, just so we can laugh at them. Oh yeah, we should mention we have a game. wide variety of football <laughs> teams we root for here. Matt's a Pittsburgh fan. I'm a Niners fan. Orion's a Seattle fan. You you like okay. what, New England and Seattle? Um, yeah, I I root for Seattle because I'm I'm from Washington, so it makes the people around me happy. Uh, I'm a New England fan, and I always have been, and. It's fun to be a New England fan and be into analytics because they're one of those teams. The reason they're so good is because they seek out these these little advantages. They're just constantly seeking out little marginal strategies that they can do that make them just a hair better at everything. And so they're a very analytics friendly team. Yeah, yeah. I think we should change the topic away from the New England. <laughs> There's, there's some hate over here, even though we're in Boston. So I guess we, I don't know, we, we should have gotten Ben in here. He's a Pats fan. Let's tr- let's try to nail down a couple more kind of main analytical problems that you see a lot of. We talked about kind of treating random or effectively random events as as non-random or predictive or or significant. What are what are some other things that you've seen that frustrate you out there? Oh, that's a great question. So. Obviously, one of the biggest ones is misunderstanding the difference between explaining and predicting things, Um, because people go for all the shiny stats that are like, you know, wow, this really explains why the game went this way, but it has nothing to do with future games. Um, Another big one is is misunderstanding context, and this is a this is a big one that I get into with the algorithms that I use to predict games, and and this is driven, I think, in large part by fantasy football because fantasy football makes people obsessed with totals, total yards and total mm-hmm. touchdowns and things like this. But it, it, it neglects the context that makes these things meaningful in the game. And my favorite example of this is if you ask somebody, is a one-yard run good? It's like, well, that's an impossible question to answer. If it's a one-yard run on first and 10, that's not good. If it's a one-yard run and you're on the one-yard line, well, then it's a touchdown, and it's really good. And so a lot of what I do with my algorithms is I sort through the plays and actually try to parse the context out so I can say whether these plays were good or bad because I've actually, well, I mean, I haven't personally looked at it, but the algorithm has looked at the down and the distance and the time remaining and things like that. So neglecting context i think is a really big problem that i see in how people look at sports and a lot of that is understandably driven by fantasy football which leaves people just obsessed with totals yeah well yeah. the big the big comparison in baseball analytics is pitching wins which is 
long and slowly been on the decline because it's so contingent on run support to be nearly meaningless. And uh, it'll be an interesting test because yeah. uh, the best, probably the best pitcher in the in the National League is like eight and eight. Yeah. yeah. This this brings up a question that I I wanted to ask. So I'm a big fan of hockey. I'm a big fan of hockey analytics. Hockey is hockey analytics is improving, but it's not in a great spot because it's a very fluid game with kind of limited information available. Um, we don't have player tracking. Um, it's probably the only thing that could improve it. So it seems like the entirety, like all of the advancements in hockey analytics are basically trying to figure out ways of figuring out context implicitly. With what you work with, kind of what's the kind of like breadth of data that you start with to look at context? So football is a sport that n- lines up nicely for analytical purposes because it's it's so numerical, you know, even even before you do any manipulation with it, everything has a number with it. It's downs have numbers and distances to go and, and yard mark. So the the root of my algorithm is I have I take all the plays from all the games and for every play I know a few things. I know what down it was, what the distance to go was, what yard mark they snapped it from. And then whether it was a run or a pass and how many yards it gained. Mm -hmm. And then obviously I would know if it's a turnover or something like that. But from just that little bit of knowledge, you can learn a lot about how good the teams are relative to each other. And, and then I, I know there are a lot of people who go deeper into like player tracking data, like how fast the players moved Mm -hmm. and, um, whether they're being used optimally because maybe this guy, you know, has better short area quickness. And so there's, there's a lot of like really specified work that people do on football. But what I try to do is just take the real basics of all the plays and then basically just answer this really simple question. Like how mm-hmm. good are these teams relative to each other based on this very base level data? Interesting. So I, I think like you kind of come up with summary numbers basically for different Mm -hmm. aspects of a team's game but basically what you're doing or 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 what you you could do is say like given this game context x yard x down you can compare teams kind of on that level yeah so my system are you just kind of my my system is designed to create four statistics so there's one Mm -hmm. for passing which is in terms of net yards per attempt. So we have to incorporate sacks in there. And then I also filter out and I de-weight plays that occur during uh, garbage time. Because garbage time mm. is when there's not much time left and the score is really lopsided. And so you tend to see these big chunk plays and it's because the defense is really not playing real defense because they're just waiting for the game to be over. So I, I get rid of plays like that, I de-weight them, and I create a passing statistic. And then I create a rushing statistic that's also in a, a yards per rush. And then the main, the most important play is called the success rate metric. And success mm-hmm. in the NFL, the way I've defined that is a play is a success if after the play is over, the team is more likely to score than they were before they snapped the ball. So did the play raise their chances of scoring on that drive? If it did, then it was a success. So I calculate the percentage of offensive plays that a team is successful on. And that's where all that context is is brought into it. How did you find kind of the definition of what plays increase the chance of scoring? Is that something that other analytics have kind of figured out through lots of uh, you know number crunching? Is that something you did personally? So this is not a, a statistic that I invented, though I did calculate my own variant of it. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty common one that you'll see if you read any analytics blogs, and it, it's usually abbreviated EPA, which stands for expected points added. Mm, okay. uh, it was originally invented by a gentleman named Brian Burke, who now works for ESPN. They paid him to shut down his blog and go work for them. And basically the way I calculated it was I got about, and I think I had 12 years of NFL data 
So 12 years worth of all the plays. And I, I basically, essentially, it's just the average number of points scored on drives where, where a certain, I call it a field state occurred. So, so let me give you an example. So a field state would be something like first and 10 at your opponent's 20-yard line. That would be the most common field state because that's where you get the ball after a, a touchback on a kickoff or a punt. Mm-hmm. So that's a field state. So first and 10 on your opponent's 20. And then I'd say, okay, on average, how many points did teams score on drives where they had a first and 10 at, at the 20 yard line? And then that becomes the basis of the expected points added from being there. So surely, uh, I mean, given the sample size, you can't do that for every down marker on the field, can you? Is there there's, some kind of like bidding? there there is a lot of noise, but then um, I used a there's a statistical technique for smoothing out those estimates. Okay. So the line is a little if you picture the line, it's a little bumpy, you know, because there there is a lot of noise, even though it is a a good robust sample size, but 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 then you can smooth that estimate out. So for example, we actually have a crazy amount of observations for first and ten at the twenty. Just because yeah. that's the most that's the most common play in football, the most common place to snap the ball, and so then you know we can say, well, based on all that, we know that you should have a little bit higher points expected if you're first and ten at the twenty-five because you're five yards closer. And so I use this a smoothing technique to straighten those lines out and and make the estimates a little more a little more easy to work with. But EPA is a really it's a really well vetted and widely used analytic metric. Um, you'll find it; it's pretty much ubiquitous if you parse through analytic sites. Sounds sounds very similar to my favorite uh, hockey guy who does like a game score. He has a model built on top of it that's predictive, but it's more d- descriptive, and it's basically goals added for, for a given game. Yeah, hockey hockey is tricky. I don't know a ton about hockey analytics, but I've I've done some research into soccer and I think the the problems with soccer are pretty similar in that there's no numbers really attached to it, so yeah. you have to try to get it all from player tracking, which is really hard to do accurately. The fluidity is what makes it an exciting game though. So it's like yeah. you're not really complaining because that's why people like it is how nonstop it feels, but mm-hmm. it, it does make it hard to put numbers on it. And that's super interesting. I did. I, I I knew some something about kind of the nuts and bolts of your uh, system, but I find that really fascinating. How you kind of determine success, which is really cool. Yeah, seen... and I love using that. The one yard run is probably the easiest way to explain it to people. Like yeah, all I'm yeah. really trying to do is answer that question, and that question can't be answered without knowing all the information about where you are on the field. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's it's a really illustrative uh, thought experiment. It's like adding one victory point to your Dominion deck. Yeah, yeah. It, it can be either meaningless or the most important thing to do the late game uh, is state by. Yeah. Or even more uh, abs- or obscure is adding one copper to your deck at the end of a Gardens game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you see... Cause I'm, uh, I'm curious about kind of the conservative play calling that you were talking about earlier because that's something i've repeated multiple times on this podcast avid listeners will know is that riskier plays start to make more sense the closer the end of the game is when you're losing and conservative play makes a bit more sense when you're ahead and that's like something fundamental i've had to drill down into myself and and trying to be better at board gaming do you see in football any tendency towards more risky slash rational play calling or is it is it pretty stubborn in the league well that that's what's interesting is the teams that tend to be the most aggressive and the most innovative are the best teams but actually it makes more sense that the underdog should be the one that pursues aggressive strategies because (laughs) if you come in and you're an underdog you kind of have this expectation that like well, the other team is better than us, so if we just go out there and play a traditional slug match, you know, a slug fest, and we each run 60 normal plays, they have a better quarterback, they have, you know, better coaching and all this, they're probably going to win. 
So the underdogs are the ones who should be trying to create variance. Right. Because they're they're chasing from the start, but they don't. They're super conservative, and then that's why they lose, because they, they never take risks. Right. So if they have if they're going into the game they have a thirty percent chance to win, they want to force it outside that first standard deviation of outcomes. Uh, yeah, that's that's exactly the way that I like to put it is if you think about it statistically, underdogs have a better chance of winning when the the standard deviation is higher is is one way to think about it. You want more variance if you're an underdog. Yeah. But instead they pursue low variance strategies and they lose cuz they're not as good. Right, right. Or they or they attempt to run when the defense knows that they're going to run. So that's something you posted on Facebook. Was, was Gruden said uh, that, it's, right? It's something the yeah. New Seahawks <laughs> offensive coordinator said. Oh no, the New Seahawks. Yeah, it was. Uh, to be it was. Seattle. It was Schottenheimer, uh, Seattle's new offensive coordinator, said the key to winning games is being able to run even when your opponent knows that you're going to do it, which doesn't make any sense because a everybody knows that running the ball is the least important thing in terms of playing offense. And B, basically what he's saying is we just want to go out there and like be more manly than the other team and, instead of trying to be unpredictable. Sounds like football. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's like the thing is instead of so many teams, instead of coming up with an innovative or, or clever design, they think they can just like if the speech before the game is good enough and like the smelling salts are powerful enough that their players will just go out and just be stronger today even though you know everybody kind of knew that they weren't as good as the other team and then that then they get beaten it shouldn't be surprising to anybody yeah yeah uh i would be amiss if i didn't mention your your oft repeated mantra that running backs don't matter i think that is delightful <laughs> underscored by uh pittsburgh's game this weekend yes. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, um, it's pretty well established that running backs don't own their production. It's mainly a function of the coaching and the offensive line and the design of the running game. Yeah. And the way you know that is that the yards per carry, the efficiency of a running back, is actually predictive of how efficient his backup will be. They're very highly correlated. Okay. Huh. And yeah. that's because... They're, they're not correlated to each other at all. It's because they're both correlated to the same thing, which is how good the rest of the offense is, and the, especially the offensive line. A couple of weeks ago, I was hoping that you would tell me that Le'Veon Bell is special, but can you just tell me that Le'Veon Bell is not special now? <laughs> Le'Veon Bell is special as a receiver. Okay. He, he's a good receiver. Le'Veon Bell, I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that the Steelers on the whole, perform worse without him. In fact, Le'Veon Bell's a nice natural experiment because there's two great things about him for this discussion. One is that he's widely regarded as one of the best running backs in recent memory. And the second is that he's missed a lot of time with injury and suspensions. So we actually have a pretty good comparison of how good the Steelers are with or without him. And it turns out they actually score about half a point more in games that he doesn't play. Yeah, I remember seeing that. <laughs> yeah, that's... And oh, go ahead. One of the big reasons for that is because when he's out, the Steelers tend to throw the ball more, which is actually a more preferred... It's it's a, it's a the more optimal offensive strategy. So it's almost like when, he, when their running back is out, they get tricked into playing a smarter offense. That was exactly what I was going to bring up, and it's... That's such a fascinating thing. I think you you wrote something about this with Seattle's running back problems from a year or two ago, or, or injuries. Yeah, the 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 best year of the Seahawks offense in the Russell Wilson era was that era when Marshawn Lynch was injured and and just couldn't seem to string together many healthy games, and they didn't really have a backup plan. So they started throwing it a bunch, and they they scored a lot more than they did when Lynch was in even though Lynch was clearly a better running back than his backups. It's like the fact that he was gone tricked Seattle into playing a better offense, which I I just love that. It's great. Well, it also illustrates that how important it is to understand causality, right? Because someone who saw that 
that data could interpret it as, oh, Marshawn Lynch wasn't actually a good running back. But that's precisely the wrong way to think about it because you don't understand the causality of exactly. the situation. Uh, which... Yeah, it, it's not that Lynch was worse than his backups. He, he was clearly a better running back than his backups. It's that when he was out, 10 or 11 of those runs per game became passes instead, and the passes were higher value than the runs, no matter who the running back is. Mm -hmm. That stuff is so cool. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about? I know I told you this would be like 30 minutes. We've gone beyond that, and I apologize. Well, that happens when you end up talking about football. That's kind of my life story, so yeah. I had a great time. Great. Matt, Ryan, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about slash ask? I mean, I could keep I, talking about this yeah, stuff I guess for hours. Yeah, I guess we could go on for questions. hours and hours. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll do another I'll sometime. Do, yeah, maybe we should do that. Maybe we should plan like some way, some part way through the season or whatever. We could talk about some interesting analytics, statistical coaching things that have that have happened so far. I wanted to comment. Just it seems crazy that there's such a huge inefficiency as just like passing more is better that the league can't adjust to that. I'm going to keep going back to hockey as, as long as we're talking about analytics. But it's really cool in hockey, there was an inefficiency in smaller players. And that, again, is just like kind of a macho sports thing is like we want big players, big players hit hard, that's good. And all the numbers show that that's not good for actually winning games in hockey. The market has adjusted to that now. And small, fast players are more correctly valued at this point um, but it's, it's crazy to me that like sam correct me if i'm wrong but it seems as simple as like passing is good <laughs> but yeah uh, but i mean we've the, seen the football it's... men don't want to do that well we've seen the nfl adjust a bit i mean look at like the patriots offense yeah and the saints it's, offense yeah, yeah. Uh, i guess except for last year but the when Saints it... ran a lot but uh, well, another example would be the so-called three-point revolution in basketball People finally realize. Well, I don't know if they finally realized, but they finally changed their offenses to reflect the fact that shooting more threes is more efficient, and you score more points, and therefore you win more games. Oh yeah, there was that uh, press conference. I don't know if you saw this, Sam. What was the press conference? The the college. Oh, uh, it was it was some college coach, and he was getting interviewed after a game, and the sideline reporter was like, "Oh, what you you shot a lot of threes." Was that a by plan or something? And he's like, yeah, well, if we shoot from that, the best shot in basketball is that corner three. And the second best shot is any other three. And it's worth 1.5 points per possession, whereas a mid-range jumper is worth 0.78 or something. So we want to keep shooting threes because it's better. Um, <laughs> yeah, and this actually is a nice tie and kind of like a wrap up on what we were talking about earlier, which is that underdogs should want higher variance. So this last year in the March Madness tournament, we saw the first number one seed yeah. ever lose to a number 16 seed. And then we saw an 11 seed, I think, Loyola Marymount, Loyola, Loyola Chicago, that was it. They made a run all the way to the Final Four, and it's like, well, how did those underdogs do it? Three-pointers, because three-pointers are the equalizer. They didn't go in there and be like, well, we're going to be really macho and really manly, and we're going to go try to out-rebound this bigger division one team that's bigger, a foot faster, taller than stronger, us stronger, better athletes <laughs> yeah what can we do we can shoot the three and and that's that's what you do is you take a high risk strategy you risk you know shanking all your threes and looking like fools you take the risk and it works because it's it's what you have to do when you're the underdog yeah yeah the thing with passing in football is that it's both more efficient and you succeed more often. So I don't understand why teams don't pass more. I, there was just this article on 538 from this analyst I follow. And he was saying that when there are, I think, seven or more men in the box, it's like the success rate of a th passing play is something like 20% higher than, you know, on average across the league than running in that situation but teams run the ball 20% more than they pass. And last year, I think the Eagles were the only team that passed more than they ran in those sorts of situations. And lo and behold, they won the Super Bowl. And obviously, there's more than that that goes into it. But I, I know why teams don't pass more, for the record. It's because they still think that you have to run the ball for your play action to work. 
even though there's a ton of analysis that's shown that play action is a super effective play, even if you haven't been running the ball well at all. Yeah. But teams still think you have to run to set up the pass. And well, I think once they get over that hump, you're going to see teams, you know, like once they clear that mental hurdle, I think you're going to see teams that pass the ball like probably 70% of the time, I think would be a pretty appropriate ratio. But there's just these mental hurdles that they are trying to get over that they haven't yet. Yeah, but you'd think, like, even with that ideology, like, you could recognize that you're on the wrong side of kind of the the returns curve, almost like a, yeah, like a curve. And if you just erred on the other side, you could just use the same old uh, thinking to say, okay, well, our passes are now setting up our draw plays. Like, you have a play on either side of that to kind of balance it out if you think that you need to use that kind of trickery on the defense. Yeah, I, I I don't I don't quite know why teams haven't figured it out yet. And I think a lot of it just has to do with the age of a lot of, a lot of these coaches and just the fact that they're brought up they rise through the ranks of coaching working for these older guys who have been around and so I think it's just sort of like an institutional like staleness for lack of a better term. But look at the coaches that are being so successful. They're overwhelmingly like pretty young and are, are, are known predominantly for being super creative on offense. And mm-hmm. that's why they're being so successful. That's how the Eagles won the Super Bowl. Well, I, I mean, it's lagging behind, but presumably success with more modern uh, strategies will eventually cause the rest of the league to catch up. It'll just be slow going. I did notice more teams going forward on like fourth and two this past weekend, but maybe that's just confirmation bias. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it took forever for baseball teams to recognize that on base percentage is more important than batting average. It took a long time, but, uh, yeah, I, I know that from Moneyball. I, I yeah. don't really know a lot about <laughs> baseball. I don't really know a lot about baseball at all, but even I know that. Yeah. 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 It'd be interesting to see how the season plays out, see if there's more. Uh, more passing or more creative offensive schemes. It'll be excited to see. Uh, thanks again for uh, coming for, on. For sure. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, we'll try to schedule something maybe later on, if you don't mind, and uh, talk about something more. You know, let's talk about the, the uh, 2018 season as it progresses. I think that'd be super fun. Yeah, sounds like fun. Thanks, guys. No problem. Oh, just to let, let uh, listeners know, you can find Sam's predictions analytics random posts about different topics like teams that are going to over or underperform you can find all of that at pete ratings.wordpress.com that's p-e-t-e ratings.wordpress.com i highly recommend you check it out all kinds of great stuff even if you're not interested in football i think it's valuable for understanding how to think rationally which is always good thanks for listening everybody don't forget to check out the thoughtful gamer don't forget to rate and review this podcast on itunes or wherever you get your podcasts from check me out on social media on twitter and on facebook and if you would like to watch our podcast our main podcast uh, recordings live join our discord and have all kinds of other insights into the thoughtful gamer go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer help us out i would greatly appreciate that thanks for listening goodbye bye adios